Hello everybody, welcome to the Harm Reduction Report. This is Willard filling in an absent void where your pal Cal usually is. I'm sitting here alone recording the intro this morning. It's Monday morning, December 18th. This will air tomorrow on the radio. We're going to be playing a 50-minute clip that Cal and I recorded when we were speaking in Frank White's class last week at UND. Frank White teaches drugs in society at the University of North Dakota. He is also the faculty advisor for the UND Psychedelic Club, of which your pal Cal is the current president. Um, that's also, again, a co-chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Frank invited Cal and I and a few of our friends into his class, and we spoke for an hour talking about some harm reduction things going on at UND, um, things that we're trying to do as a chapter, trying to tell some stories and open it up into some conversation. I love speaking in Frank's class. We've done this before, and this was really fun the first time we recorded it. And we just recorded it on my phone, so the audio is not the best, but you should be able to hear everything, and there's a couple audience questions and things so we'll cut right now into the clip from us speaking in frank's class and there'll be about a 10 minute discussion at the end thank you everybody sam bag on but today the psychedelic club is going to kind of inform you guys about some harms reduction information Um, i have a couple announcements from frank that he wanted me to give you guys so don't forget about your final that's on next Thursday the 14th and it's at 315 in this classroom. And then also make sure you guys do all your online quizzes as well too. He also recommends to do the study guide. It's not due or anything, but it always helps with like the matrices and everything. And then the last thing is that if you guys have any, any questions on any of your grades, make sure you guys talk to him next week, not the week after, because he's not gonna help you the week after, but if you have any like things you want to challenge, I guess. Talk about next week and then maybe you guys can figure that out. But other than that, all these guys here are going to inform you on some great information. And that sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks for being here. Enjoy. All right, I'll kick us off here. Perfect. Thanks for being here, everybody. Welcome. We are the Psychedelic Club, and we are also, we're a dual chapter, so we are also a chapter of the Students for Sensible Drug Policy here on campus. Uh, My name's Cal Datz. I'm the current president of the SSDP and the Psychedelic Club. And uh, what we are is we're a harm reduction club. We, we are a club, you know, our, under the harm reduction model, our stance is we neither condone nor condemn drug use. We simply acknowledge and appreciate the fact that, you know, drug use occurs. And our goal is to educate, educate people and just open up, you know, a, a candid and open and honest discussion about drug use to help mitigate the risks involved with drug use and just help people become more aware of things about related to drugs. Uh, some of the things that our group celebrates <clears throat> and supports is things like this substance testing kit that I, one, of, one of the members brought in here. We'll get into a little bit of that, like why those are important. Essentially testing your substances. We'll explain why that's important in a little bit. We support things and we celebrate things like the use of Narcan. We have Tristan Meadows over here who is uh, with the Students for Opioid Solutions and he is working to get people here on campus to carry Narcan, which is a drug used in in case of opioid overdose. It basically can reverse opioid overdose. And I'll let him explain a little bit more about that in a little bit. We celebrate things like Suboxone, which is a medication for opioid addicts to help them essentially stave off the physical withdrawals of opioid addiction so that they can conquer the psychological components of addiction and basically get back into the normal swing of things. Hi, welcome. Um, the medical amnesty law, we celebrate things like that, which is, you know, if someone is having an overdose, you can call contact to police, and police will show up and basically save the person's life and, you know, be a little bit more lenient with whatever was actually happening on the scene as far as drugs were involved. You know, they'll be a little bit more lenient and basically save somebody's life and then go away. Uh, Clean needle exchanges is something else that is statistically supported and statistically shown to help uh, prevent the spread of HIV and hepatitis C and just encourage safer drug use in general. And we uh, aim to just educate 
and I think a good comparison to make with our group is when you think about sex education and condoms, you know. <clears throat> uh, abstinence, if, if you're preaching abstinence about sex and, and offering no further information about sex and, uh, you know, sexually transmitted infections and the dangers and, the, you know, the pros and the cons of everything related to sex, then you are seriously limiting the knowledge that people have about sex and, and you're, you're limiting their ability to be safe when they do that kind of thing. It's like ripping condoms off the table if you were to not have harm, harm reduction groups. Harm reduction takes many forms. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so we talked about most of that stuff the last time we were here at the beginning of the semester. Maybe y'all remember us. I see some people I remember. Uh, my name is Will, if you remember that. Uh, can we have a raise of hands on how many members of the Psychedelic Club are in the room right now? Yeah, we got a few here. Yeah. Okay. It's like... Including us, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's like a dozen people. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, have you guys talked about harm reduction in Frank's class? I know you have. Was that like a recent? Yeah, we, we discussed it this week, a little bit last week. We didn't get too far in depth, but we, we covered some of the basic things, just needle exchanges, you know, Suboxone. Um, we covered opioid overdose, that kind of stuff. Um, Sweet. Did Frank talk about that phrase, harm reduction? Uh, a little bit, not or, too much, but yeah. I think you should go into your spiel. Which one? <laughs> Something about the name. We probably already talked about that last time we were in here. But uh, you all know Tim, right? I just want to make sure we get introduced to everybody. Tim, yeah, he's in your class. Uh, and Tristan, um, we just met Tristan the other day. So he is this website right here. You can scroll around in it if you want to show him anything else. Yeah. So this website's for students for opioid solutions. Um, basically, it's a group that uh, started only a couple months ago, and. Uh, this statement right here by Jared Fras, I know him personally. Um, he, uh, last year, um, short and simple, he lost a friend to opioid overdose. And uh, uh, Students for Opioid Solution is trying to push training and Narcan, the solution uh, to opioid overdose, across universities nationwide to prevent it um, from happening in the future. So um, what we're doing here on campus is trying to get training for hopefully everyone on campus and what an opioid overdose is, kind of similar to how you guys all had to take that sexual harassment and assault training online, took about an hour trying to do the same thing with opioids, and then getting Narcan on campus. Currently we have a, a bill passed through the student government that will bring Narcan on the campus in the future, and uh, the university police department will actually start carrying, um, they're getting training uh, over Christmas break, after that, they will start carrying Narcan to um, prevent an overdose if one does happen. And they can save someone's life that way. That's cool. How did you start that conversation on campus? Was it difficult to get the administration or the student senators on board with that kind of harm reduction? So um, once I found out about this group, because I wasn't part of the founding of it, but once I found out, I contacted Gerald and um, he kind of set me up on how to uh, get it on campus. and I contacted one of the student senators and we introduced a bill and uh, a newspaper article actually came out in the Herald about students for opioid solutions and after that it kind of took off real quickly the Grand Forks public health coordinator pitched in helped out um, university police chief he was all for it so several different factors and then with the passage of the bill allowing it to be done and then the state risk manager uh, for police officers that also had to approve Narcan because police officers won't, uh, they won't approve to carry it. So if a police officer did use Narcan on someone, they could be sued civilly, even if they did save someone's life. So once the risk manager approved it, uh, Chief Plummer, he was all for it. He had with the passage of the bill and the funding was already there, so we were able to start actually doing it and getting Narcan on campus. So sometime next semester, you'll probably see Narcan on campus in the form of like a kind of the AED type boxes in the residence halls and wellness centers and common areas. That's awesome. In the residence halls too, is that for sure? Or yep. Still working on that. Yep. It, uh, for sure, I will be going in the residence halls. That's cool. Nice. Uh, Frank was speaking last week at the Christus Rex at this event called Thirsty for Justice Thursday, and it was about addiction. And was it Michael Doolitz that you talked yep. to? Yep. Yeah, there's that as well. Michael Doolitz was just hired by the city of Grand Forks as the first opiate response project coordinator. And so he just started and he's 
the city has a bunch of grants to do things like bring Narcan and uh, do other projects and educational things. And uh, he was speaking with Frank at this event uh, last week. And Tuva was there. What did you think, Tuva, about listening to Frank and Michael talk? I think it was very inspiring. They were all about harm reduction, not so much about condemning as uh, you usually hear from uh, official people. Uh, was Frank, I think I asked you this earlier, but was Frank any different? I've never took a Frank White class, so I don't, I haven't heard him lecture a lot, but it was fun to hear him talking at that event. Was he the same? as he is in class? Uh, yeah, he talked a lot like he always does, and he tells some funny stories. <laughs> some funny stories. My mom grew up with Frank, and since Frank's not here, we could probably share some funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. How about a sad story, actually? I was going to start off with showing um, something here. Um, last year... Uh, a friend of mine, May Lee, she uh, went to Grand Forks Central. I, I graduated from Grand Forks Red River High School. Um, we knew a lot of people who died from drugs growing up. It was unknown people in high school and in college and after college. I went to UND. And uh, it's, um, we know a lot of people who died. She made a documentary called Faded with the City about some of those people. And this is one of our friends. I'll just see if we can play a minute of it here. I get up. I make his sandwiches and put his cooler on the table. I wait for my cooler. Just about to have my ID because I have to drive away. I go down and get my sandwich for his job. In that morning, I get there in the morning, I got up, I made his sandwiches, put his cooler on the table, got everything ready, and before I leave, I go down, then the door come up over. I go downstairs and see the lights on down on this in the bedroom. And I open the door. Son, my boy, get up for work and he wasn't moving. So I, I, I bed, sit for you in the bed and he gets up. Okay, Dad. Good. And I didn't. He didn't move. So I went around to the front of the bed. His eyes were open. And he aspirated already from the drug. And I grabbed him and I turned him. And my son was already stiff. I let on the screen to his mother. I was I was still in bed. Um, I hadn't gotten up yet for work that morning. I <laughs> I heard him. I heard him call out in a way that I have never heard in my entire life, and it's. I knew. I knew something was really wrong, and so I ran out of bed too, and I ran downstairs, and uh, I think he was in shock by then. Um, and I went running in the room, and I saw Evan too, and. I yeah, you, you should watch this whole thing if you want. It's really good. It's got a lot of stories, um, a lot of local stories. And I just want to show one little three-minute video that our club made last year um, about this, and then we can probably open up for some conversation and ask some questions about it, and everybody can throw in. And we'll get into the substance testing stuff here too, because uh, to explain real quick, like Evan died from an opioid overdose. Maylee's documentary, they screened it at the Empire downtown last year, and we were there and we filmed the question and answer panel. And this is just a three minute clip of a longer video we made that um, kind of highlighted how Maylee, they, they took a bunch of stuff out of her film about harm reduction, they left in all the sad stories, and when the panel went up on stage afterwards, they took a very different approach than Maylee wanted to take. They did not take a harm reduction approach took a very abstinence approach. This is just a, a, a clip of it, but it'll get us into Tim telling us about substance testing and maybe why or why not that might have helped people like Evan. But we'll we'll just just this. Uh, We don't have a solution, because if we did, we would be 
you believe in something strongly, advocate for it. Uh, we're trying to be very direct to get an organization on campus uh, with its basis on like drug education, essentially, anywhere from alcohol, on or to fentanyl. Uh, some of the things that we found to get that uh, you can essentially test drugs. That decisions are made by that person, that they're going to take that drug. Um, and by providing the kit, they'd be able to know what they're taking and prevent overdoses. And I was just curious if you guys uh, had any comments about the variant of that. I would say time out, no way. You're not going to be able to create a kit that's going to be able to determine the potency of the chemicals that have come out of China that are changing on a regular basis. <laughs> Back. It was supposed to be a community discussion. It was supposed to be open for people to feel like a safe space. It was supposed to be that. You're coming from an uneducated aspect. You've never heard of this drug testing yet. Um, so, I mean, this is interesting to say that. <laughs> I know as soon as what I said last, like tonight, was wrong, when I, the way that it was delivered and communicated, but we still sat here and had a moment where we realized we don't know everything. And then you look at the other side, those people that were laughing are discontinuing about their day and don't realize that maybe their mindset isn't right. Because, yeah, his tone is a little bit whatever, but so was Chris Myers. <laughs> I mean, his tone wasn't any better at all. All kids make bad decisions. If you're a parent, engage, right? Monitor what they're doing. There's a flaw in our communication, and we need to close that gap. People that are leaving there only got abstinence as the only solution, which is contagious. And that's really unfortunate, too, because it's not at all the idea that I wanted to get across. The older generation needs to start trusting us a little bit more because we are trying to help. We can't do that if you're just going to completely disregard what we say. So basically, that kind of hits at two important points. There's this question about what substance test kits are and when are they effective and when are they not. And also, the, the communication problem that we're having between some of the established older people and some of the younger people with other ideas. They said something and then we said something kind of lashing out and everybody's lashing out at each other and then nobody's finding the common ground and all that. So really, like what we wish we would have said there is, Substance testing kits, one thing, and then Tim will explain more. Um, it can't tell you the, it can't tell you everything. So it can't test potency. And he wasn't wrong when he said that. These drug testing kits do not test potency. They test to see what your substance is or if your substance has been changed in any manner whatsoever. Um, I travel to a lot of music festivals throughout the country at all times during the year. And every time that I go, I'll make sure to be in a very, you know, um, noticeable camp spot and I have this huge sign that I put right in front of my campsite that says free drug testing here. I bring all of these little kits and I will pop them up right here. Um, this kit right here is the Marquee Testing Kit. Uh, the Marquee Testing Kit comes from dancesave.org which is where you can order these if you want. There's a total of maybe six to, excuse me, six to nine different testing kits. Um, but what they do is they test your substance. Um, it comes with a little booklet, all these different instructions inside the booklet. Um, you open the first page and it tells you exactly what to do. Um, it comes with this little vial of liquid and it comes with this little testing bottle. You take one-tenth of whatever you have, one-tenth of your standard dose of the drug. You put a couple drops, two to three drops of the testing liquid inside and whatever color it turns, that tells you roughly what this substance is, right? Um, if I move to this page, this is the page that I usually um, see most people go to when I go to music festivals. This is the page for MDMA ecstasy. Um, and you can see that MDMA turns brown and brown to black. And what this is is the sooner you or the closer you move into the inner circle, um, that's one second all the way to 60 seconds worth of reaction time. So if you think you have ecstasy, you put a little bit in this bottle, put a couple drops in, it should turn black. And uh, the problem with that is, as you can see, there's a lot of different substances that substances that could be black. You have, you know, 5-ABP, you have standard MDA. So what they do is in the back of this testing kit, if you buy additional testing kits, 
you can find the drug you're looking for. Let's say it's MDMA. Um, if it passes the marquee testing kit, meaning it you know turns black, you can move on to the next mecha testing kit, which will turn a separate color and has drastically different color schemes. Um, and as you walk your way down this you know little step chart, you can be fairly sure that you do not have anything other than what you think it is. That won't tell you potency. It's not 100% guaranteed or foolproof, but it's better than saying, hey, look at this you know, piece of powder that I found or someone sold me. He told me it was ecstasy, so I'm gonna take it. The most common thing that I see when people try to buy ecstasy in different festivals is their substance will turn yellow, which is indicative of all these different kinds of bath salts. Um, I've had many people tell me that, you know, you saved me or my friend's life today because we thought that this was ecstasy and we were going to take three pills before the headline show. And three pills of this bath salt would have killed me. Um, I see the same thing with LSD. There's a separate kit you can get for LSD, the Ehrlich test. You can get one for psilocybin and mushrooms. All of these things are just little steps that can help minimize the risk because once again we don't condone drug drug use but we don't condemn it we know people are going to use regardless you can tell people till you know you're blue in the face that methamphetamine is bad for you that heroin is bad for you there's still going to be people that are going to take it for whatever reason and we want to make sure that they take it if they're going to take it in the safest way possible so in the clip when chris myers said there's no way these tests are going to be able to count for everything that's true because Somebody could pass all of these tests and there could still be something new in there that the kit doesn't pick up. And even if it is exactly what you think it is, it can't tell you your potency. But if people still had done all those tests and one of them had turned up yellow, say, they would have not continued to use it. So uh, our friend Evan, who, who died, you know, Chris Myers said drug testing kits wouldn't have helped him because he might have gone through and checked out everything was right and he could have still overdosed, it's true. But at any step taking those things, it might have told him that you do have a known adulterant in here and you don't want this and you would have, you hoped, not taken it. And days. these testing kits test for an insane amount of drugs. Most people haven't heard of most of these drugs. You know, each page of this is a completely different set of reactions for a different type of drug. And in the back, it even tells you a list of drugs that don't have a reaction, some of which I know come you know, straight out of Russia because I've tried to do research on them, like when. You know, these little numbers are changing every year just because uh, we talked about it in Frank's class. You know, This becomes illegal, so they add a new molecule on top of it, so it's not illegal, and it just becomes something that's super dangerous. Um, another thing that I try to tell people to go to is uh, ecstasydata.org. And it's uh, an extremely interesting site. And what it is, is you, it's funded by the Earwood Center, which is a center for drug education, earwood.org. And you can anonymously send in your ecstasy pill to their professional certified lab. And they will test it, and they will post on their website what it is, what the person who sent it in said their dealer said it was, and if there were any adulterants in it, how big it was, things like that. Um, you know, you saw Frank talk about the different types of ecstasy pills that existed, like little UPS symbols. Um, here's one I f that we just found called the Heisenberg because it's, you know, uh, in the shape of, you know, Walter. But uh, they tested it, and it had methamphetamine and caffeine in it and no MDMA at all. That's something that you can do to see what's, you know, what's going on in this. And it said it's mostly caffeine with traces of methamphetamine, and this got sent to them November 28th, so that's not too far away, and it's 300 milligrams worth of a pill. Um, these are things that can definitely save lives. Um, I know a lot of people at music festivals, I've told them about this, and they said, well, I just got you know the, the Bugatti symbol ecstasy pill, so they'll look it up on here and say, okay, it's the exact same color, and this was a recent test, so maybe this came from the same batch. This is what it says it is. You know, it's not foolproof, but it's absolutely better, once again, than just saying, someone sold me this pill, I'm going to take it, because that's what they said it was. Yeah, but it's also hard, because some people might use this to make copycats of something. If something mm -hmm. comes up and mm -hmm. says, oh, the UPS symbol is clean in Baltimore right now. Somebody can read that and then make some dirty UPS symboled mm -hmm. pills. And so it's like a constant... Like it, it's kind of ridiculous how we we uh, would have to uh, drug users would have to go through all of this to find out what they're taking, right? Uh, the best form of harm reduction would be not do any drugs at all. But if you're gonna do them, the best way to do them is to get them from a doctor, right? Because there's no way that it's not what you 
they say it is. Like when you get a prescription for something, even if it's an opioid that you could become addicted to, at least on the bottle, they say exactly the dose. There's no chance there's fentanyl or something else in there that could make you overdose. And uh, so that's one way, you know, if, if, if we didn't have to get this stuff on the street, then people wouldn't have to worry about, is this really what I say it is? And you probably found out that a lot of people don't have what they think they have. No, most people that I see when it comes to testing stuff, at least at music festivals, is they assume they get MDMA and they get bath salts. And I've had people say, okay, you should test this for me. I saw your sign. Um, I bought this from the dude three campsites down, right? Um, and, you know, I'll test it, and they'll say, yeah, they said it was a super quality product. Like, they got it from the, the trusted friend source, all this stuff. And I test it and say, sorry, man, you know, this is bath salts. I don't know what to tell you. Um, you can have the rest of it back. Like, you know, I'm not – the only reason I do this is to make sure that people are safe. And instantly they'll walk out of my tent. They'll go to somebody else, and, you know, they'll go back to the person who sold it to them, absolutely chewing them out. And I've seen quite a few fights break out because of it too. Um, you know, I try not to get involved in that aspect of it because I'm just part of the safety portion of everything. But there's a documentary called What's in My Baggie. And the first couple of moments actually show people's reactions to buying quite large amounts of drugs <coughs> at festivals and getting them tested. Um, this is the dude from the bunk police who made this testing kit. Um, they went around when these first got invented and first started becoming mainstream. They went around to people, different music festivals talked to law enforcement officers about the legalities of this and just started filming and seeing what would happen. All these kids thought they were high on mom. So every single sample I tested, it was methanol. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. 100% methanol. Unbelievable. Yeah, purple to black is uh, MDMA, highlighted yellow is bath salt. So uh, there's no ambiguity there. There you go. Was shaking around. Doesn't let him just have to shake it up there. And bath salts. So we got the yellow bath salts. That's bath salts. <laughs> to ingest that so it's not that funny <laughs> uh, the, the first person who founded the psychedelic club in Colorado Boulder they were they had these test kits available so we brought one here to show you but we're not allowed to uh, use, like yeah um, to use it yeah the the people in Colorado Boulder as well as a couple other um, SSDP chapters are allowed by their university and by the local police department to rent these out Right, one of you could text me and say, "Yo, I need to borrow this kit. Uh, I'm trying to test this substance. I could give it to you. You can give it back to me a couple days later, whatever it may be." And that's the end of that. Hopefully, you learned something. Hopefully, you, your friend, didn't overdose and die from whatever you were taking. Um, unfortunately, here things are a little more conservative. Um, I'm I've been in contact ever since we started the club with an attorney in town. Um, he specializes with law in North Dakota and Minnesota. And the second that you put any type of illegal substance in this kit, it becomes drug paraphernalia. It depends. I've talked to him about it, and it, he kind of came to the conclusion that it depends on the, on the police officer whether you'd actually get arrested for it or not. You might be able to fight it in the court of law, you know, going off of the harms reduction model, <clears throat> if you can prove that, you know, that was the reason for it. But... As of right now, in North Dakota and in Minnesota, this is considered illegal once you put an adulterated substance in here. If you go, if you watch this full documentary, What's in My Bag, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's super interesting. Um, the people who do this are in contact with all of the police officers there, and all the police officers, wherever they go, they don't mention location, said it's totally fine. They can absolutely do it. Question? Is this YouTube? Yes. Okay. This is on YouTube. It's a free documentary on YouTube. I wonder, Tristan, you had to get Narcan on this list as a, what, what was it called exactly? Oh, like the like state this risk manager? a safe tool. Like we so, approve this tool, right? So for like, as you might be aware of, like police officers, they'll cover it under insurance for like certain things. Like if, you know, if they use handcuffs and cut and like someone's wrist gets cut for some reason, you know, they'll cover it if the handcuffs were used appropriately. But Narcan, how North Dakota was set up, um, it wasn't on like 
Uh, so only 8% of police uh, departments nationwide is using Norcan. And uh, so like right now in North Dakota a month ago, if a police officer would carry Norcan and then use Norcan on an individual that, was, that did overdose, if the person survived, they could sue the police officer civilly and the person who survived would have a great case and they would win. Um, but now, with the risk manager approving Narcan, um, Narcan is approved tool for police officers in North Dakota to use to save lives, similar to handcuffs or uh, batons, the firearms if it's appropriate, things like that. So now police officers are able to use um, Narcan and they're protected, li protected civilly and professionally from liability if something were to happen and they were to use it. Um, one thing I just want to throw in with that is if you are not a police officer, you're just a regular person who has Narcan and uses it, you are protected under law from a civil suit. I just want to throw that out there because I've had um, a Narcan that I carry with me at music festivals and when I travel for the past year. Um, I got it when it was still not available to just purchase over the counter. I had to have my doctor actually write me a prescription for it because you uh, could get a prescription for it if you, one, had a registered opioid addiction in the system or you were at risk of seeing someone who had, uh, who was at risk of having an opioid overdose. And with the things that I, I talked about, the people that I talked to, um, on behalf of the Psychedelic Club, the places that I went, I thought it was a fair thing to say that I was one of those people. Um, my doctor agreed and I ended up getting a, uh, a atomizer of Narcan, just in case. Michael Doolitz told us last week that you can now get a dose of Narcan for $25, uh, just kind of over the counter. I, I, they might, when I got the prescription, they just gave, like, it was basically over the counter, but they gave me the prescription over the counter, and then I got... It was, it was really easy, but it was. I still got a prescription for it. I think now you don't even need a prescription for it. Or no, soon? no. You just. Uh, it's a little more expensive, I believe, but you can get it OTC. You just have to ask them for it. It's not something that's just going to be sitting on a shelf. And uh, off that, if you are looking at getting Narcan, if you go to Inspire Pharmacy here in Grand Forks, they have a grant to sell Narcan for twenty five dollars, mm -hmm. and that is prescribed. And then the uh, pharmacist there will give you a little training on how to use it. Oh really. Um, yeah, the club in Boulder who first started doing the substance testing kits found that more than 80% of the students who were testing their MDMA did not have MDMA, and more than 40% of the people who were testing their LSD did not have LSD. What you can have instead of LSD is NBOME, 2,5-I NBOME, and this is like, acts like LSD, but it's uh, really dose dependent. It's, uh, you can overdose and die on it, and you can't with LSD, really, like that. But this, you can. It can uh, knock you, kill you, and um, that's what the test gets for. But it was, it was actually after about a couple years, or maybe just a year, that uh, James and our friends in Boulder were doing this, that their university told them to stop. And now it doesn't let them offer the kits anymore. Because of these liability issues and insurance things, and you know, it makes sense. Like from their perspective, they think if we were to open this up for UND students, you were to test it and still overdose and die, then we would be in trouble or liable, right? And that kind of makes sense to me, but it also just is crazy that we're in this position where we can't make something available. I mean, at least in Boulder, when they were using it, there's people who decided not to use drugs because. <laughs> of the testing kit, you know, and if the testing kit wasn't there, they would have used them and they would have been well, not even what they thought it was. And, and with that being said, we aren't allowed to give these to you, but what we are allowed to do is tell you to buy one. This kit that tests all these substances, $20 online, your life is worth $20, I promise you. And it's like, a, we keep calling it a kit, but all it is is that one little liquid. It's one, yeah, it's one vial, vial and some liquid and a yeah. book. But it saves lives regardless. And, you know, most of the time, um, the latest data that I saw was 88% of people who thought they had um, ecstasy had either ecstasy, bath salts, or methamphetamine. And with this one kit, all three of those substances are drastically different. So even if you only want one and you don't want to go through all these steps and pay $20 for the three kits you need to be, you know, relatively sure that what you have is ecstasy, this one kit will do pretty well. And this is the marquee kit, if anyone needs to write that down. Cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to show you guys uh, 
we won't go more than 10 more minutes or so, I don't think. Um, but anybody's welcome to stay later and hang out with us and chat. Something that, this is really good timing. Uh, so Frank had to keep changing the time we were going to come into class. Uh, and then also the snow day on Monday, we were going to speak yesterday in, the, in his Wednesday section. We, we couldn't because they had to move stuff around. Anyway, it worked out really well that is today because for the next four or five days, um, voting is going on to choose the sessions that are going to be at this conference. So Students for Sensible Drug Policy Conference in Baltimore in March. We're trying to go, and Frank's going to go with us if we get our thing accepted and we're going to speak at the conference. We have two different uh, pitches in there. One talking about Suboxone, which maybe Cal could explain real quick. Yeah. What our pitch is about? Yeah, so so our pitch basically, my dad is a Suboxone provider in Bismarck, North Dakota, and I don't know what you guys know about Suboxone. Tim mentioned you guys did a little bit of Suboxone, a little discussion about Suboxone, but it's, uh, it's a drug for opioid addicts that, that they can take, you know, as I mentioned, to push their withdrawals off and, and get back into the swing of things. And, you know, part of my passion for this club, part, part of the how I became interested in this was that I actually went through an opioid addiction when I was younger, when I was you know, 19, 20, 21, for a couple of years. Uh, I was using intravenous opioids, pills and heroin and even a little bit of the fentanyl patches. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I got, onto, I got onto Suboxone. My dad actually set up the appointment for me. He knew about it. I, I wasn't aware of Suboxone, but I got onto Suboxone. I've been clean for seven years now from opioids. And uh, you know, Suboxone was a real, real lifesaver. So, what, one thing that uh, you know I want to mention is I, I've encountered a lot of stigma, a lot of sort of this question of like, oh, why does it matter? Why, why harm reduction? Why not just abstinence? <clears throat> and uh, you know, people, people have this attitude that once you're using drugs, you're it's too late. You're already, you're already done for. You, know, you know, focus on the other people, but. Uh, I like, I like to mention that that's not true. Here I am, you know, I have one semester left in college. I'm studying for a major in psychology, minor in chemical dependency. I'm gonna do some drug addiction counseling. And so, I, you know, it's, uh, I'm living proof that you, you can contribute. If you have this harm reduction mentality and you implement things like Suboxone and Narcan, you save, save opioid overdose peak victims, um, you know, they can contribute back to society and they will. Uh, so that's sort of essentially what our, our pitch will be about at the, this SSD conference is sort of discussing Suboxone uh, with my dad and uh, yeah. stuff like that and why harm reduction is important. And the other proposal that we have in there is to speak about Andrew Sadik. So I know we mentioned that last time we were in here. Um, everybody remember Andrew Sadik, that story? He was North Dakota college student two years ago. He was arrested for... Actually, you play the first minute of this thing. Yeah, I haven't seen this, so I'm uh, interested. Happy <laughs> birthday today. Probably not which one you don't remember. Yeah. Shall you really? What do you have going on? that you probably want to help yourself at all. Okay, like you said, you're facing two felonies, and then of course a misdemeanor charge from yesterday. Two felonies uh, of deliveries uh, since they took place on campus, both of them, um, their hands, so they're class A felonies, uh, 20 years of prison, 20 felonies on a fine, and they're both. Okay, so potentially the max is 40 years in prison, 40 felonies on a fine. You understand that? Yeah. Okay, obviously you're probably not going to get 40 years, but uh, is it a good possibility that you're going to get put some prison time? Um, if you don't help yourself out, yeah. So then that is a North Dakota college student being threatened with 40 years in prison for selling $40 worth of marijuana in his dorm. Yeah. And they brought him in on his birthday. So they arrested him in the dorms probably a few nights before this. Mm -hmm. They said, just come in. Don't tell your roommates or anybody that you're coming into the police office and we're gonna give you a deal, we're gonna talk about a deal. So that's what he's offering him here now. He says, if you want this potential 40 years in prison to go away, you can go undercover and wear a microphone and go on six different drug deals with six different drug dealers that you are gonna go out and find, 
and we'll arrest them, and maybe we'll lower your alleged 40-year sentence. So if any lawyer had seen this, was sitting next to him, they would have said, absolutely do not take this deal. You're not going to mm -hmm. see any prison time for selling $40 worth of ganj in your door. Especially because it was his first offense. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's ever, no way. And, uh, but they said, if you tell a lawyer about this, we're going to take the deal off the table. And he didn't know. He didn't know. So he agreed to this. And a few months after this conversation, he disappeared from his dorm. Nobody knew what happened. A few months later, they found his body in the Red River, a backpack full of rocks, bullet hole in the head. It was on his sixth and last buy, the person he was dealing with found out that he was narking on people. So they, we don't know who still murdered yeah. him. It's and unsolved murder. That. Then even later, it came out that he was serving as a confidential informant at the time of this, of his disappearance. Nobody even knew that. Um, the police were not forthcoming with that information. Mm, they didn't tell his parents for months after his death. So, um, Andrew's mother, Tammy, for the last two years has led a lot of uh, efforts trying to reform the use of confidential informant policies in North Dakota. And just last year, they passed Andrew's law, and it was signed by the governor. And now it's supposed to uh, have more regulations on how police are supposed to use confidential informants. And it's supposed to give people like Andrew in this situation, make sure they ha he has a lawyer present before he agrees to go undercover. But the bill, when it was first written, it got watered down and watered down, and now the version that's been passed is not adequate. Um, but it's something, it's something in the right direction. So we've been in touch with Tammy Sadik and their lawyer, uh, Lance Block, and our last pitch to speak at the SSDP conference will have Tammy and uh, their lawyer and Frank all having a conversation about harm reduction policies and stuff like that. Um, and it's great that the, this lawyer, Lance Block, um, he passed something called Rachel's Law. The same thing basically happened in Florida. Uh, an SSDP student, actually, she was an SSDP member, like we are, in their club in Florida about five years ago and she was arrested for selling marijuana in the dorms. The police had her selling methamphetamine and a handgun to people. It's like <laughs> nothing she was dealing with when she was arrested. She went on an undercover situation with this handgun. She gave it to them. They found out she was gonna narc on them and they killed her with the handgun the police gave her and threw her body in the ditch. And, uh, this lawyer, Lance Block, helped pass something called Rachel's Law which is what Andrew's Law is um, modeled after. So it's really cool that we're in touch with all those people, and we've been, because we've been telling their story for so long and not actually having them on our side, and Frank is all excited, and he'll get to speak about this and help us talk about how we're supposed to explain this, how do we educate people about harm reduction, in certain cases like this and everything else. Um, so uh, we're really excited, and we hope we get selected, because if we get selected, then we get money to actually go and we can spend a weekend there talking about this and make videos about it. And, uh, whoever joins the club can probably come with us too before then. And that brings me to this point. If you, uh, please, before you go, if you're interested at all in talking to us, uh, put your name and your email on here and, uh, and vote on that thing. Uh, go to conference.ssdp.org and you can vote on the sessions. And if you choose our sessions, and you put your name down on your thing, then we can count your votes, and we can go to Baltimore and talk about all this. And if anyone's interested, look at this testing kit a little bit more. I'm going to leave it up here, so guys, feel free to take a look through the booklet, see if the substances that you're looking at are in there, anything like that. Yeah. Um, anybody have any questions or comments or anything? We'll be hanging out, so please come down and chat with us if you want. But otherwise, have a good day, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for your time. So there it is. That was the Psychedelic Club's presentation in Frank's class last week. I had a wonderful time doing that. Um, it's where I met Cal, actually. Uh, well, probably a year and a half ago or two years ago, I was speaking in Frank's class uh, when I was the president of the Psychedelic Club and the Students for Sensible Drug Policy chapter. Frank was our advisor then. Uh, he had me come in. I was talking. It was fun. And, you know, you have a wonderful time. Uh, like again in this room I was making eye contact with people people seemed to be interested in what was going on 
it was an interesting time, as we usually speak in Frank's class, the very last class period before final exams, which is the case again this year. And actually, same thing like last year, we were supposed to speak in two sections of Frank's class, but once again, a snow day, the very last week of classes, uh, bumped everyone's schedule back, and we didn't get to speak in Frank's Wednesday section as we normally uh, as we were planning on, but <laughs> everybody who was there, you know, it's like the stuff that uh, we're going over on this day, I don't know if Frank puts on the exam. I don't think he does. I mean, Frank wasn't even there, <laughs> so the, he, he's not going to put uh, test questions on uh, their exam on the material we were going over. So that is an incentive for people to tune out or not show up at all or, I mean when you're studying for finals and you get a kind of a free period, that's a nice thing. Despite all that, it was, uh, I was very happy to see that people were still engaging with us and uh, interested in the conversation. Um, we got a few people to write down their names on the, on the, uh, interest sheet as they were walking out. I don't know yet if any of the ones who did went to vote on our session proposal to speak at the SSDP conference or not. But uh, either way, I am happy to announce that since last week when we recorded that, um, our proposal to speak at the SSDP conference in Baltimore in March was accepted. So we had submitted two proposals, one about Suboxone and one about confidential informants. Uh, The one that was accepted was the confidential informants uh, agreement. So... Right now, our big challenge, our mission, is to get all of our proposed speakers get their travel and lodging paid for during this time, and to get as many students from the Psychedelic Club SSDP chapter uh, paid to go as well. Uh, by getting our proposal accepted, we can we don't automatically get all the money we need to send everybody. However, SSDP has a few other scholarship opportunities for students and for alumni like me and uh, for speakers and guests and stuff. So, But we're applying to those kind of separately. And so we're still hoping it all works out and that we're able to get um, our speakers there and uh, get some of us there too to watch it. Um, so speaking in Frank's class was, was really good timing. Uh, like I mentioned in the clip, because, um, <laughs> yeah, it was right when we were needing practice to talk about our pitch. It was right after we submitted our, our thing and we're waiting to hear back. So uh, it's nice that we heard back now. Now we're still figuring out how we're going to make it work. Um, but I've got a good, good feeling about it. Uh, one thing I want to say uh, is that Michael Dulitz, who we mentioned again uh, in the discussion, um, he was in episode three and four of the harm reduction report, in which uh, he was talking with Frank about uh, addiction and what the city's doing. So Michael Dulitz, the Grand Forks Opiate Project Response Coordinator, he listened to our first or our last couple episodes that featured him and Frank talking, and he gave us some nice feedback, particularly. He enjoyed the fact that we emphasized that it's cool that he used Reddit and these other under, uh, uh, under, kind of, under, I don't know what you'd call them, underappreciated sources in some sense. These online resources that contain stories and information um, from drug users about, you know, what drugs are doing to them. We thought it was cool that he did that. We mentioned that on the show. He had emailed. We were emailing, emailing about something else, and he mentioned he is glad we talked about that. So I just wanted to give that a shout out. And also, he recommended uh, this podcast that I'll I'll share a link to, so everybody can check it out online. Um, he he pulled a couple quotes that he said might make some good uh, conversation for us, and I'm betting he's right. So I'm gonna read. If shame, stigma, and incarceration made people not use drugs, we would have wrapped up this drug war years and years ago. Does harm reduction enable patients? That's right. We are 100% enabling patients. 
were enabling people who use drugs to protect themselves and their communities from HIV, hepatitis C, and overdose. You are enabling an ignored and stigmatized population to feel like they have an advocate, someone who listens, cares, and affirms their humanity. You are enabling patients with the knowledge and ability to take personal responsibility for their health and their futures. By taking up harm reduction, you can easily claim the title of an enabler. More importantly, you can take the title of a person that is committed to uphold the highest standards of your profession. One who puts the patient and scientific evidence above stigma, ignorance, and shame. In doing so, you can make a difference in that patient's life, in your community, and in this country as we face this unprecedented opioid epidemic. Thank you for sharing those thoughts, Michael. I do agree they are wonderful listening for our radio show. Uh, <laughs> just reading it, I was getting a little pumped up, to, you know. <laughs> Uh, we need to hear it in, in more voices. We need to hear new and more perspectives on all of these things so that we can feel more confident in our ability to come to the most sensible conclusion. And so things that involve the word evidence and inclusion are things we should probably be associating with as much as possible. You know, one thing I really loved about the presentation is listening to Tim. Uh, I don't know if we gave him a, a proper introduction. Maybe we did. Uh, but Tim was the one describing his experience traveling to music festivals and using substance testing kits with people who would like to know if the Molly ecstasy that they think they have, for example, truly is what they think it is. Um... Tim, I mean, I, I went to high school, I think I went to elementary school with Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. We were in uh, Cub Scouts together and stuff, too. But we never really started hanging out until high school, and I'm super glad that we are, you know, doing things together now because I've learned a lot from Tim, and it means a lot to me to know that I'm not the only G-Funker who cares about this stuff, and of course I'm not. Um, I guess, you know, you have the tendency to feel that way sometimes. At least I did growing up about all this. Anyway, it's good to have if, uh, people I admire standing with me and, and doing all this stuff, do, doing this together with people I love. And it was just cool hearing Tim. Tim's a good, he's a good teacher, dude. Uh, I'm going to have to tell him that. <laughs> I, I like how he explains things. And, and uh, he sounds confident, but... At least hanging out with him, I can tell like he's not going to overstate something or, or misstate something because of how it sounds or because it's uh, you know, cool or, or because he wants to sound more confident or something. He's a good speaker, so I'm excited. I hope we can do more of that. Tim and I had traveled around to the fraternities and spoken to a few of them um, last year as the state was voting on medical marijuana. And that was a really great time, so I bet we'll have more chances to go do some more of that stuff. For now, I suppose we'll wrap it up. Um, this was We had a fun time preparing for this presentation in Frank's class, and we were very grateful that people were into the discussion and all that. Uh, hopefully we'll speak again soon, and if we do, we might have more episode material. Um, we'll be on to something else next week, though, so again, like always, please message us if you have any way you want to contribute or be a part of the show, collaborate with us here. Uh, you can find us on sandbaggernews.org on the UND Psychedelic Club Facebook page and live every Tuesday morning on KEQQ 88.3 FM in Grand Forks. So thank everybody. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Cal and Tim and Nick and Tuva and Asia and Ali and everybody else who was at the presentation. And uh, Sam Begarn, I'll see you soon.